Welcome to CC Family. We pray today's service inspires you to walk closer to Jesus. Whether you're on YouTube or Facebook, we encourage you to subscribe and follow our pages to stay connected. If you're on YouTube, don't forget to hit the notification bell. We're glad you're here. Hallelujah. So the word for today is go and say. I'm going to read to you a very familiar piece of scripture of Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 4. The word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Alas, sovereign Lord, I said, I do not know how to speak. I am too young. But the Lord said to me, do not say I am too young. You must go to everyone I send you and say whatever I command you. You must go to everyone I send you to say whatever I command you. So we need to bloom. We need to thrive where we're planted. Do not wait for that moment. Some have idealized that they will obey God fully when everything is just perfect, but that day is never going to come. You need to bloom where you're at, right? So in the 11th century, King Henry III of Bavaria grew tired of court life and the pressures of being a monarch. So he made an application to Prior Richard at a local monastery asking to be accepted as a contemplative and spend the rest of his life in the monastery. Your Majesty, said Prior Richard, do you understand that the pledge here is one of obedience? That will be hard for you because you have been a king. I understand, said Henry. The rest of my life I will be obedient to you as, to, as Christ leads you. Then I will tell you what to do, said Prior Richard. Go back to your throne and serve faithfully in the place where God has put you. When King Henry died, a statement was written. The king learned to rule by being obedient. When we tire of our roles and responsibility, responsibilities, it helps to remember that God has planted us in a certain place and has told us to be a good accountant or teacher or mother or father. Christ expects us to be faithful where he puts us, and when he returns, he, we will rule together with him. Now, going back to the prophet Jeremiah, he told them, you know, when he called you, I've appointed you as a prophet to the nations before you've been formed. And Jeremiah is looking at himself and says, I'm too young. God, are you sure you got the right God? I'm too young. <laughs> I'm too young. And God replied to him, do not say I am too young. See, we have learned this severe consequence of any counter declarations. When God says something, he says what he means, and he means what he says. Um, if we begin to spew forth what we think, you know, that can be a contradiction. And, and who, can, who can cancel the will of God for your life? Only you. The devil can't. Circumstances can't. Only you can, right? So we don't want to uh, emit any counter declarations. These counter declarations can alter our destiny and cause us to veer away from God's intended plan for our lives. When God makes declarations over our lives, it's not based on any of our abilities or qualifications, but it's strictly based on who God is and what he's doing. It's not based on how well we look, but it's based on the fairest of 10,000. The word of God here is, go to everyone I'm sending you and say whatever I command you. That's the, so in Matthew 28, the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him. But some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Jesus sent his disciples to preach the gospel. In John chapter 20, again, Jesus said, Peace with you, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them, and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins will be forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they're not forgiven. After God gets through telling Jeremiah, don't say that you're too young. He proceeds to tell him that he must go to everyone he sends him and say whatever God commands him to say. The two operative words for today are go and say. The calling of God is not just an appointment with the bestowing of some titles or position just to make us feel special or important. God is not into creating mystics, much less superstars. His call has a purpose, a very practical, applicable purpose. And it is given to individuals who have their feet firmly planted on the word of God. Repeat with me, the call of God has a purpose. 
See, some people want to mysticize and, oh, they, they're in love with the feeling of the call, but they don't want to get to the grind of the call. When God calls and he, and he appoints, it's because he's sending you somewhere to someone to say something. So this commission is about action in real time. It's about doing. It involves work and it involves effort. It involves consistency when you feel like it or not, when you, right? Because there are days that you don't feel like, like doing something. Like, like if you need, if you work to make a living, you show up whether you feel like it or not because you got to get, you're looking for a paycheck. Otherwise, you don't get paid. Well, when God commissions you something, you have to overcome those feelings of, of, that come sometimes of discouragement or lazy. You don't want to, you just show up. How do you administer what God has given you? By faith. It's not by feeling. You do it by faith. Amen. By the, uh, so, it is, involves work and effort. The call, by definition, implies a cooperation between heaven and earth. He did not call us to stay put, be isolated, and to remain silent. No. Something that sending forth means that we're to go to a different geographic location. But God is sending you to the field and the place where you already planted. In that location, there are specific people that you're supposed to reach. There are people in your life that no one else is able or supposed to reach. No one else can take your place. There are people in your life that I could never reach, just like there are people in my life and sphere of influence that I'm supposed to reach. God has given you the keys to the hearts of the people in your life. This is, this is called a door offering, uh, utterance. It is uh, uh, open doors. It's called destiny. It's, the call, it's called divine appointments and kingdom connections. Your sphere of influence is the greatest mission field there is. Don't ever forget that God will hold you accountable for the people he has placed in your life. So if you want to go to preach, write minister in a different geographical location, but you're not reaching the place where you're at. Then what? So then all of a sudden you think you're going to have the courage to do that somewhere else, but not where you're planted. So you need to, you need to flourish where you're planted, right? How do you go to these people? Well, you allow the life of Christ to be shown through your life. You walk one step of obedience at a time, one day at a time. And the people don't so much care how you do and how you praise and worship the Lord when things are going well. It's when the rubber meets the road. It's when when crisis happens, when things that you don't like take place, that's the point where you, you have the ample opportunity of showing forth the fruit of the Spirit, amen, in your life. Praise God. They're watching how you, because there has to be a difference between those who are the children of God and those who are not. So we must be different. We must be different because we show forth the life of Christ. Amen? Does that mean that you don't get disappointed? Of course not. Does that mean that you don't feel pain? Of course not. Yes, you do. But in spite of the pain, in spite of whatever, in spite of the injustice, you still choose to do what's right. Because Christ in us is the hope of glory. And he gives us the strength to overcome. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. You allow the life of Christ to be sh sh shown through your life. There are some believers that are so good at blending in that the unsaved have no idea that they are saved. There is something wrong with this picture. When, your life, when you have the life of God in you, there is something different about you. It's called the light shining in the midst of darkness. So what happens? Darkness is simply the absence of light. Darkness is simply the absence of light. Amen? So you can see up to, I don't know, at least a, a mile or two away in a perfectly dark night, you can see just one candlelight. Just, that's pretty amazing. There are people who do hostile, at, at times they get, you know, they get into, into witnessing, which is great, and I, I want to encourage that, but at the same time, they fail to show forth with their life and actions the life of God, right? Ask God for divine appointments and kingdom connections. Ask for a door of utterance. So, there are people that no one else can reach except you. God has already given you a feel where he's sending you. Have you ever arrived somewhere without a purpose? Have you ever arrived at an airport in an unfamiliar city? And the people or the person who's supposed to pick you up is either delayed or worse yet, they have forgotten. That's happened to me. <laughs> that doesn't feel very good. Been there, done that. I have a few t-shirts. I love, I love to travel and see the world, but what makes this travel very special and significant is that when I do so, I have a purpose for this travel. There are people that I'm sent to. 
they are a part of the assignment for my life. They are usually people that I go to see and there are things that God has commanded me to say. I'm not just going there to just visit. I go there on an assignment. You're there on a mission. Amen. So the command today is go and say. These are the main ingredients of the Great Commission. The Great Commission is not just for the disciples, but for all of us. You must believe that your steps have been order of the Lord. God has given you an assignment for the particular place and people that you are, go, you are to go to. If there were no people in that geographic location, then it, should, it would be pointless to go to a place just for the sake of going. One of the basic requirements for ministry is that it is about people. You know, it's a funny thing. I've met a minister or two who cannot stand people, yet they are ministry. It doesn't compute. It doesn't compute. Just go do some computer work on your own. But... You know, it's about people, broken people, fickle people, lovable people, unlovable people, and everything in between. Praise God. Amen? Praise God. So, if there were no people, there would, be, there would not be any ministry. There would be no purpose. The purpose is people's souls. Souls. That is why we need to go and say. The Bible tells us in John 3.16, and you know that, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son for whosoever, for people. Amen? So God loves and still loves the world. He loves people. God loves individuals. The reason God has, done, has gone through all this trouble is that God is a God of love interested in the salvation of individuals. Love has its manifestation when you are interacting with others. In other words, love has a relational goal. Love has a relational goal. And love can only be demonstrated in the context of relationships. You can be in love with the feeling of love, but unless you are in relationship with individuals, that love has no way of being expressed. Are you, I, so how many here have ever been disappointed or hurt in a relationship? A hundred percent of us. Amen. Praise God. But the love of God is not the brotherly love. It's not the phileos love, but it's the agape love of God. And if we have Jesus in our heart, we have agape we have agape, and we move out of a place of agape, not out of a place of phileos. And the greatest problem with the body of Christ today is we're trying to phileo, so brotherly love others, when we're supposed to agape them. Are you with me? Some more of that in another occasion. So, if we love those who love us, there is no reward. But when we love those who are unlovable, then we're, we have a reward in heaven. They will know that we are Christians by our love. God cares enough about the wayward people of this world. He came to seek and to save the lost. His desire is that no one should perish, but everyone to come to a place of repentance. God never calls anyone to isolation from people. God will never call anyone to be isolated from people. The heart of God is a lost and dying world. When you come to know Christ, you will get to know and love him. And as you love him, he will assign you to the, with some task that you are to do. Some have fallen in love with the call itself and with the title and the recognition that this might bring to them. There are certain benefits that come with the call, but more important than the benefits are the responsibilities that come with it. When God gives you a call, it cannot be compartmentalized. You cannot restrict it to just certain hours and location. Are you with me? So the call of God is not just a title, it's a function. It's a function. More than a title, it's a function. You know, if you do what God called you to do for long enough, people will call you what you are, right? Even more than a title or a function, the call becomes an identity. Ministering is not just something that I do during certain hours of the day on Wednesdays and Sundays. Ministry is my very identity. It is what God has called me to do. Being a minister does not hinge on having a church or a congregation. So, see, the word ministry means to serve. You're looking for opportunities to serve. Amen. So you can minister to others and serve and facilitate. Amen. The glory of God from going into places. And you want to be a blessing to people. Long before I stood upon a flag. Long, long before I was publicly giving prophetic words. God sent me and still continues to send me to, to, to the person that's isolated. With no cameras, no microphones. Praise God. And God is just as, as proud of our obedience in that place where no one else is watching. Amen. When we're going to the ones that nobody sees. Amen. 
So we need, maybe it's time to, to stop looking for a platform and start looking for a place to function. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Most of the Almighty. Meaning that if you dwell in the secret place, amen, you're hidden. You're hidden in Him. And you do that from a hidden location because in that hidden place, you're secure in Him. And if He knows what you're doing, that's all that matters. I minister more in my job as a doctor than I do at church. It has to be birthed out of a passion for what God is passionate about. I've said it before, and God, I will say it again. God is not inter entertaining truths. God has called us to equip us so that he can send us. He equips us so that we can go and then say what he's saying. As we learn his word, we're not just learning it for self-edification or inspiration. No, we're learning the word of God so that when we go, we will know what to say. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If you notice, very few people get saved. Can you hand me the microphone, son? If you notice, very few people get saved from just reading a book or a tract. It takes someone who will speak the word under the anointing. That is usually how faith arises. The call transforms your way of thinking and your behavior. Anyone who says that they are called but yet does not exhibit passion for souls is not truly called by God. This this passion for the lost consumes you. You no longer live for yourself or your own agendas. Now, now the purposes of heaven become more important than your own. You delight in doing the will of the Father. You dream with doing what is in the heart of God. It is so important that to have the heart of God. So it's not just saying when you give a prophetic word. I want you to understand this. Because I've met, I've seen people. I've, look, I grew up under the pew. And I've seen I've seen angry prophets. I remember when I was a kid, there was this particular lady. My God, I still have like, oh, my Lord. Now, she was anointing. There was anointing in her life, but she was always angry. She was always angry. So it's not just what God is saying, but in the tone and with the attitude. That's so important because you want to reflect the heart of God in what you're saying. So it's not just words. Have you ever been told the right things in the wrong manner? Right? And it hurt. Because it said all the right words, but the tone was really wrong. So they hurt you with nice words. So when you give the word of the Lord, it has to reflect his heart. So it's a responsibility, not just for the content of the words. Right? But it's a responsibility that we will be clean channels that can reflect his heart. What is the heart of God? The heart of God is not to burn you to a crisp or slap you down. That's not the heart of God. See, we cannot use the prophetic gift to beat others over the head. We must be full of the agape of God, the agape, the love of God, so that we will reflect, reflect his heart. I, I remember several years ago, particularly... Um, we're in my house, and there was this younger lady, and her mom was there, and there were a few of us. And, and I remember so distinctly that, you know, I was just praying. I was just, just praying, and, you know, that, you know, she was already an adult, but a younger lady. And, you know, she had been assaulted when she was younger. And I was like, what, Lord? How do I say this? Right? How do you say it? Lord, give me the give me the right tone because that's such a such a delicate area. It's like you're going in to somebody's chest and you're performing. If you deviate just a little bit, you can end up with a dead patient. That's right, that's when doing surgery. You understand, Dr. Lily, that <laughs> no pressure, right? <laughs> no pressure. But but in the spirit it's even more important because it determines our eternity. So is what we say, but with the heart of the one who's telling you to say it. And if you don't have the heart of God, you shouldn't be speaking his word. Does that make sense? I know I've been beaten over the head with the word. Listen. Listen to me. We must acquire the heart of our Lord. 
that his desires will become our desires and that our eyes he can see through our eyes isn't it amazing I've, I've encountered people and I've gone over and over and the Lord just the sermon reveals to me what they've been doing I'm going like ah yuck the Lord says now go we'll have them and I'm going like really yeah you see because it's his heart thank God that he does not look at our messes right but if we if we surrender and we repent he will forgive us and he does not does not you know love does not keep records of wrong aren't you glad for that aren't you glad and as we pr pray in earlier forgive our debts as we forgive those who have who are debtors amen praise the lord thank god for that thank god for the mercy and the grace of god but i took a rabbit trail let me get back on <laughs> Are you with me, church? How many understands that he loves you? He wants to use you. You have a purpose. You have a purpose. Amen? Praise God. So, the call of God transforms your way of thinking and your behavior. Anyone who says they are called but does not extend passion for souls is not truly called by God. So, in Isaiah chapter 6, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on the throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him the seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces. With two they covered their feet. And with two they were flying. They were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. And I'm going to skip to verse 6. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongues from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away. And your sin is atoned for. Then I heard a voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and whom will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. He said, Go and tell these people, Be ever hearing but never understanding, Be ever seeing but never perceiving. See, the call of Isaiah came at one of the most worst moments of his life. Up to this point, Isaiah had enjoyed all the benefits of notoriety and favor. It is believed that Isaiah was the cousin of King Uzziah. So, as the cousin, he had privileges and influence that gave him security and stability. He had carte blanche. He had diplomatic entrance, right? He had recognition. He had status. He had status. He was an influencer. You see, a lot of people are vying for, to be an influencer. They want to be an influencer, right? So, but one year, on a particular day, day that year, King Uzziah died in life, and life as Isaiah knew it radically changed. The rug was pulled from underneath him. It was no longer business as usual. His comfortable nest had been shaken, and nothing seemed certain anymore. It was at this very moment that Isaiah lifted his eyes and looked. He had probably looked many other times, but this time it was different. Now his King Uzziah had died. Now he looked and saw the Lord. When he saw the Lord, he did not see him worried about the current state of affairs in the nation of Israel. God was not pacing back and forth on his throne rooms, trying to figure out how to solve the crisis that Isaiah was experiencing. No, he saw God exalted, high, seated on a throne. He saw him in an entirely different light than he had ever thought before. If you're experiencing trouble and find and you're experiencing trouble and crisis today, if your king Uzziah has perished, if what you thought was certain has moved or been taken away, then I invite you to look up. Don't look at your situation. Don't wallow in failure and depression. Get out of the place of anxiety. You know, I, I am amazed today that the enemy has seated an entire generation with anxiety. I'm not, if you're dealing with that, I'm not here to condemn you. I'm just here to tell you that there is hope. There is hope and there is healing and there is strength. Even children today, you know, it is shocking, quite shocking, right? Don't look at your situation. Don't wallow in failure and depression. Look and then you will see. Look and then you will see. You will see that your crisis has not taken God by surprise. You will see God high exalted and seated on the throne. It's like I went fishing one time in Florida up the coast and I mean, the waves were such that a Lord, and all of a sudden, everybody in that boat got deathly sick, seasick. And we were like, and, and 
And as I looked at the boat, I look at the waves around me, I got the sicker, I got the greener, I got, but, but then I look at the shore, I look at the steady, stable shore, <laughs> firm ground. Now, I will give anything to get a helicopter and fly me there immediately, right? That's what happens to us when we get in crisis. We think we're out on our own, but we got to go back to shore. We got to go to the place of firm ground, the firm foundation. Jesus is the rock. Amen? If you're... So, you will see that your crisis has not taken God by surprise. You will see God as highly and exalted. The one seated on the throne will never fail you. You will see him in a place of rulership and authority. He's at rest because way before crisis ever came to be, he already had the solution and the way out. Even before bro war broke out against you, God already had secured your victory. You see, the call of Isaiah came at one of the most inconvenient of times that there was. God will al allow the king Uzziah's of our lives to be removed so that our, your, our eyes can now focus on him. Isaiah had to have a revelation of the immutability, stability, and eternity of God. His eyes saw God, but the object of his revelation was not to, feel, to make Isaiah feel super spiritual so that he could get a warm, fuzzy feeling. It was not for promotion so that he could feel elevated in relation to other prophets. No. It was not that at all. The object of his revelation was not to congratulate Isaiah. No, the object was to allow Isaiah to place his trust and hope in the eternal almighty God of the heavens and earth. The one and only God who rules and reigns forever. The object of the call was, was whom shall I send and who will go for us? Because God was allowing Isaiah to see him and says, now, son, at this place of authority, stability, and immutability, the calls from, from that place. And when God, the callings and giftings of God are without repentance, this call is secure. I will not change my mind about you. I have sent you. I have chosen you. The object of the call was, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Make no mistake about it, whenever our spiritual eyes get open and we begin to see to the supernatural, it is because God is intending on sending us and giving us something to say. I have seen during my lifetime people in the body of Christ who usually begin well. They start out with the right motives, yet somewhere along the way they begin to do their own thing. They begin to isolate themselves. Isolation, isolation, it, 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 it is troubling. And, and particularly for us men, us men, you know, and, and it, just, ladies usually talk about it, but us guys, we just kind of withdraw, right? And uh, so, but there are individuals that begin to isolate pride and arrogance at times may take root in their hearts. They may have at one time received a call from God, yet because of their lack of accountability and character, they become self-centered. They take on the air of super spirituality. They become critical of leadership and begin to draw others to themselves instead of to God. They feel that others should be submitted to authority. Always, interestingly, the rules that they apply to others, they fail to, to apply to themselves. And so it goes on and on. They, they give themselves titles or prophet this, or whatever that, or apostle, and so on. They will gladly remind all of us about their titles and positions, but they will not submit to authority or be accountable. I, I re recently read a blog from Pastor Mark Driscoll, and the title is How to Interpret Christianese. How to Interpret Christianese. And the, the word operating word is, I prayed about it. Translation, what the Christian means is that they're about to throw a fit but wanting to look spiritual instead of childish. He or she is hoping that saying the word pray will overwhelm you with, with awe at their deep spirituality and cause you to fall into a catatonic state where you nod your head and agree to let them say or do whatever they want. And then the other, the Lord told me, translation, I want to do something that you don't want me to do. So I'm pulling rank on you by saying that Jesus sent me a text, but did not include you in that message, which means that you disagree with me, you disagree with Jesus, so that you should humble, should be humble, and let me do what I want, because if you don't want, you don't want to disagree with Jesus now, do you? Not to be rude. <laughs> to be rude. Translation, I'm about to assault you. I will likely yell at you, make up horrible things about you, and ruin your life. I've already sent an email to the entire church ministry 
with a lot of exclamation points and out of context Bible verses connecting Judas to you, Judas, you and the Antichrist as the false trinity sent to deceive the whole world the last days of deception. The other famous saying, with all due respect, with all due respect, translation, I have no respect for you. I despise you. If it were not a crime, I would do horrible things to you. And I still might get away if I can find a way of getting sued or arrested. I've already gossiped behind you, behind your back, and I already sent them up out to look for pitchforks, a rope, and some matches. Number five. I know you're really busy, but <laughs> some Christians are good at making people feel guilty so they can manipulate them to get what they want. Practically, what they're saying is, I'm more important than anyone in this ministry. I'm more important than your family. I'm more important than your wealth. Whatever else you have to do, you need to drop it all right now and take care of me. If you don't, it is because you're, you're unloving and not like Jesus who loved people. And the other famous one, no offense, but... Just as, just as an apple falls on the head of an unsuspecting victim in a cartoon and someone yells, duck, just a second too late. No offense, but is what Christian says right before they drop an anvil on your head. What this means is that, they, that he or she has been planning to offend you and now will be offending you while at the same time trying to get, get you to sit there and endure the whole offense by confusing you with the word, words, no offense. It is a diversionary tactic, like when a bank robber sets off a smoke canister to distract the guard while emptying out the till. And the last one, I don't mean to be divisive, but, translation, I've already recruited a faction to join me. We have taken all the nice people of the church ministry as hostages. Underneath our choir robes, we have explosive duct tape to our chest. And if we do not get what we want in this hostage negotiation, we will ignite the whole church. <laughs> Let's go on with the sermon. I found it interesting. The call of God is not centered on individuals, but it is centered on God himself. See, it's about God and it's about souls. This call may take us to some very elevated places of importance, but it can also and may take us to some very low places where those who are not called would, would never seem to feel the urge to go. Verse 9 sums it up clearly. Go and tell these people. Again, we see that with this powerful vision, there was a commission for service summed up in the words, go and tell. This is what happened to Jeremiah. He received the very same message. It was not, do not say that I'm a child or I'm too young. No, the directive was, you must go and say, go and tell. When you're called, you better have a revelation of who God is. Isaiah thought he knew God, but after all, after all, Oh, he was a prophet who heard from God and who spoke the oracles of God. There are people who confuse the call of God. They believe it is a platform to be used for self-promotion. There are some who have delusions of grandeur. They dream of the time when their ship will come in. But they fail to get on the daily tugboat of obedience. Come on. They keep dreaming of when they will be famous. Oh, they will use scriptures and talk about God, but if the truth be known, the motives are very twisted. Many use the name of the Lord because it is convenient and politically correct. They should, draw, they should draw people to the foot of the cross. However, they are recruiting followers to themselves. They are building their own kingdoms instead of the kingdom of God. May the Lord have mercy. Amen. And the Bible speaks to us in Matthew chapter 7. Watch out for false prophets. They come out to you in sheep's clothing. But don't worry, they're ferocious wolves. By their fruit, you will recognize them. Right? So, and then in verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, they will not prophesy in your name. And in your name, they will not drive out demons. And in your name, perform many miracles. Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. That's strong stuff. I believe that some start out right. They begin with the right motives, yet somewhere along the way, some have lost sight of the heart of God. Some become deceived. When you're deceived, you don't know that you don't know, right? It's a sad day when we think that the accuracy of, of our prophetic words and our ability to cast demons and our ability to perform miracles constitutes God's seal of approval of our lifestyles. 
This is a major trap. The common quality of all those who are called by God is that they go and they say they go wherever and whoever God has told them to go. They say whatever God has ordained to say. They leave aside any personal agendas or opinions. They're just a messenger. It's just like the microphone that I'm holding in my hand right now. This microphone could not express fluently any thoughts or words because it is incapable of doing so, right? It is not just... But when I put it in my hands, it amplifies my voice. It amplifies my voice. It's, it's just an instrument in my hands. It has no thoughts of its own. Unless a person speaking into it, it would have nothing to say. Right? So it is with all of us in the hands of the Lord. We, don't, we in and of ourselves do not have the appropriate words. Our ideas of themselves do not lead to much of anything. Yet in the hands of the Lord, when we allow Him to speak in and through us, when there are no distortions in our lives, when there are no distortions, come on. When his voice can clearly and purely be amplified in our lives. What a difference does that make? All of the background noise gets eliminated. Because it's crisp and clear. And the clarity of his voice, which is unlike any other voice, begins to come through. This is what makes all of the difference in the world. It's not because of our witty humor or well put together and brilliantly composed sermons. No. It's when we're speaking what he wants us to speak in the tone and attitude that he wants us to. The message of the gospel is not just a make me feel good message. The gospel message will confront sin in love. God loves people the way they are, but he loves them too much to leave them the way they are. We need to begin to realize that we may love people, but we cannot love them as much as God does. He who he who the Son sets free is free in this. So the call of God translates into action. The verbs, again, are go and say. So many times in my life I've felt the call of God to go to a particular nation or place or state. God is the one who makes the connections. And then I get an invitation. Well, I've been a few times when the Lord tells me I'm supposed to go somewhere. But there's a minor problem. I can't invite myself. Or I mean, I guess I could, but that wouldn't go over very well, now, would it? So you have to wait on the Lord that the invitation will come. And surely, because the one who spoke to me about me being there will speak to the man of God or woman of God in that place who will set forth the invitation. Amen. So, listen, don't invite yourself somewhere. Can I give you just a pastoral? Ask your pastor to invite yourself over. Wait to be invited. Amen. Wait to be invited. If God puts it together, he'll make it flow. God will make it, I guarantee he will make it flow. And if you haven't invited yet, it's because the time is not right. So wait, I say upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord, amen? Is this okay, church? Amen. When God says go, he expects me to take ownership and responsibility for my call. To put it in everyday terms, I'm the one who has to look at my schedule and rearrange what needs to be rearranged to make sure that all areas are covered. Just because God tells me to go somewhere to, to someone does not give me the authority to be negligent and leave things in disarray. Amen. You remember in, in the book of Luke when uh, John and Elizabeth, right? Yeah. And he was standing, they had, were barren, they didn't have any children, they were well advanced in years. And John was doing his duty in ministry. And he, at the, when it was his time to enter into the altar, at the right hand of the altar of incense, an angel was starting and he was, he was afraid. And, and he began, the angel began to speak, right? And, and says, you, your wife will have your son. And, 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 you know, he was just so taken aback. And he was in unbelief and he was mute. But you know what? Even though an angel had appeared to him, even though... He said that his wife was going to have him a child. Do you know the Bible says that, that he finished the time of his service before he went home? He finished it. He, even though he couldn't talk, he could still do. <laughs> Are you with me? Sometimes you can't talk, but you can do. Amen? Praise God. Sometimes it's a little, there is a song out there that says a little less talk and a lot more action. 
Amen? Praise God. All right. So, just because God gave me to go somewhere does not give me authority to leave things in this array. God expects us to carry ourselves with dignity and to be trustworthy. God will not make the plane reservations for me. He will not make me get on the plane. These things that I do because I have a call in my life and a specific set of instructions from God to do so. In other words, I am to go and say he gives me the directives and I execute the plan. He gives me the directives and I execute the plan. But we do everything. Amen. And we pray before. And you see what I'm saying? Praise the Lord. So, I'm, I'm, so your pastor, I'm teaching you. Because things are not going to just drop out of the sky. He gives you a direction and then, okay, Lord, if you tell me to go, you get the invitation. You pray about the time when there is agreement where you've been invited. That's important too. There's agreement with the authority in that place and you. Then you set the time. You got to trust the Lord because he's already given you a green light. Then I go and make the reservations. Then I get on the plane. There's a whole host of things, right? And we have to take responsibility. And that's called work. It's called organization. You have to invest yourself in those things. Amen? Praise God. So, there are some who sit in churches for years. God has called them. They have specific instructions and directives in their lives. Yet, they sit in church waiting, uh, waiting. Some expect to be tantalized and intellectually stimulated instead of becoming useful. Some become super spiritual or even worse, too mature to roll up their sleeves and become participants in what God is doing. I declare and decree today that you're not here by accident God has brought you here for a specific purpose he has called you to go and say this church is an equipping center this church is an equipping center why do you think we go through the lens to invite the presence of the Lord during our worships it is important because God can do in a few minutes or in a few moments more than 20, 30, 40 years of counseling and self-help books. Amen. The Spirit of God can intervene and all of a sudden bondages fall away from people. You change your mindset. Hallelujah. See, because when the presence comes in, the glory is a place of eternity. And the eternity is the eternal now. Where there is no past, there is no future. Everything is now. Now faith is. When is faith? It wasn't. If not, it will be. It is now. Now faith is according to Hebrews chapter 11. When we... We don't go and say when we're not busy about the master's business. Then we can become, we can become self-centered. Those who do so become dissatisfied with everything. And on and on and, you know, and then it begins to breed because people then become miserable because they're not doing what Jesus said to do. Listen, I got my hands. I got my plate full with things. I don't have time to, to, to feel miserable. I got, I, I, I'm about my master's business. And yeah, is there some discomfort to my flesh? Absolutely there is. But so what? So what? <laughs> Hallelujah. If, if you're feeling, if you're starting to feel uncomfortable, talk to the disciples. Talk to the martyrs of the faith. Talk to them. Amen. Praise God. Because we cannot, look, this light and temporary trouble cannot does not await the level of the glory that's coming. Hallelujah. We need to understand what's taking place. So, well, there's a difference between peace, peacekeepers and peacemakers. Peacemakers, it has nothing to do, with, and, and, and it comes out of the book of James, right? But wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace, all and consider, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, of good fruit, impartial and sincere peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. Notice that peacemakers, it has, not, it has nothing to do with being a, peace, being a peacekeeper. When you are walking in obedience to the word of the Lord in your life, then you become a peacemaker. Those who walk in their, those who walk in their own agenda following what seems best to them, those become peacekeepers who compromise the truth and want to make friends for themselves. Peacekeepers come from uh, pe uh, peacekeepers compromise principles for notoriety, profit, and comfort. 
A peacemaker, on the other hand, is someone who is following after God. It is someone who is not afraid of confrontation with the powers of darkness in prayer, prayer as they intercede for the well-being of the church, congregation, and the leadership. It is someone who is not easily offended or angered. A peacemaker is not a gossiper who spreads false rumors. It is someone who finds out facts before forming an opinion. It is someone who looks at fruit, longevity, and stability over time instead of believing someone's unfounded allegations. Why is it that we're so quick to believe allegations? But let me just jump ahead. <laughs> Amen. Praise God. So, I'm going to read to you the book of John chapter 6. Jesus said to them, very true, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. To eat the flesh and drink his blood talks about being in covenant with God. This is about communion, right? When you're in covenant... You're in agreement. That means that you are in submission and obedience with the one you made covenant with. John chapter 14, Jesus answered, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you're not going in obedience and saying in obedience, then you're not obeying him. If John chapter 14, verse 15, if you love me, keep my commands. In 1 John 5, 2, by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep His commandments. So if you love God, then you will keep His commands. When you go, then you are to speak. You just don't go and sit there without saying a word. I'm going to ask the worship team to come forward. So I'm going to finish this word today. What are the operating words? Go and? Again. And say. What are we doing here? We're getting equipped to go and say. We're getting equipped to what? To go and to say. B. Myers once said, I used to think that God's gift were on shelves one above the other, and that the taller we grew in our Christian character, the easier we could reach them. I now find that God's gifts are on shelves one beneath the other. It's not a question of growing, but of stooping lower. That we have to go down, always down, to get his best gifts. The greatest in the kingdom shall be the servant of all. What is a true follower? The true follower of Christ will not ask, if I embrace this truth, what will it cost me? Rather, he will say, this is truth. God help me to walk in it. Let come what may. The story is told about a wild duck over Norway. Now, a wild duck over Norway left the wild pack of ducks who were flying in formation. He swooped down low to a barnyard to investigate the free kernels of corn thrown, thrown upon the ground and stayed there too long until he grew horribly fat. Each year, this duck would hear the wild pack returning and tries desperately to get airborne. Each year, but he couldn't. Each year, his desire to return to where he should have been all along diminishes until finally the desire was all gone. This is how we treat the convicting power of the Holy Ghost and just keep putting it off. My spirit will not always strive with man. Do not put off God. Do not put off God. You know, I go to some places and some receive me as a prophet. I'm not giving myself that title. You know how this came to be? People would come to my office and I would just look at them. Or I saw somebody in a parking lot. I just walked over. See, the devil is not going to tell you not to encourage someone. Excuse me, the devil will not tell you to encourage someone. The devil is not going to tell you to give them a verse of scripture. It's not. But when you do it, as unto him. See, it's go and say. And if you cannot just walk a few feet, go just a few feet and say, you 
loves you. He's for you. Young man, the call of God is on your life. I'm here to tell you today. Can you stand up? Put your hands up. Stretch your hands towards him. What is going on? Let me tell you what's happening. Because you begin to obey the Holy Spirit. And all of a sudden it becomes second nature. It becomes just like breathing. Because you begin to feel the heart of God for people. Go and say. The word of the Lord today is go and say. You're training, you're getting equipped so that you can go and say, where are you to go to the place where you're planted? Before you can reach Judea and the ends of the world, you got to begin in your Jerusalem. You got to begin where you are. Hey, and I see, look, I've seen nations since I was a child. I dreamt about, my mama said I woke up when I was about six years old and I I was sleep talking to her and I said mama I'll be preaching the gospel in France someday I don't remember what she told me David when you 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 sat up in bed and you began to speak to me then you would it was there about 35 years later but it happened it happened why because God knew before I was even conceived he knew that was one of the assignments and if the enemy can get you distracted in the present crisis, you got to, that's why you, you need to understand what's happening. If you don't, you'll be swept away and the enemy will get his way. So you got to get the word. You got to get the faith on the inside of you. You are who God says you are. You can do what God says that you can do. You're well able to take the land. You're well able, not just able, well able well able because greater is he that is in you than he who is in this world you got what it takes because you got him and that's all that you need you need you just have him period that's it lift up your hands there's a commissioning taking place in this church body today get full of the word get full of the presence of Jesus and everyone repeat after me heavenly father I come to you in the name of Jesus. I will bloom where I'm planted. I will obey you. I will do what you say. And I will say what you're saying. In Jesus' name. I give you my life. I give you everything. I want you to be the master of my destiny. I give up control. Lord Jesus, take the wheel. I just want to be a passenger. Take the wheel. Take the wheel. I refuse to be a backseat driver. I will stop putting my foot on the brake, my imaginary brake. Hey, Lord, accelerate as much as you want to. Hey, hey. In Jesus' name, may the glory of the Lord fill you today. May He empower you today. I bless you in the name of Jesus. The best is not behind you. The best is ahead of you. The glory of the latter house shall be greater than the glory of the former. And in this place, I will give you peace. I bless you today in the name of Jesus. Turn around and love somebody. I love y'all.